I'd like to call to order this meeting of the Upper Providence Board of Supervisors, Monday, November 15th. All right, if everyone would rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. And now we come to the portion of the meeting where we approve our board agenda. I'm going to ask that uh, you let me make the motion. I'd like to make two small non-business additions to our agenda. One is we're going to present a check to the uh, Open Hearth Foundation. And the second is uh, a thank you to the 24 fire companies that assisted us in rescues during uh, the uh, Hurricane Ida remnants. So, uh, and those will be inserted in the agenda right after the presentation by District Attorney Steele and before public comment. So yeah, that's my motion. Uh, can I get a second? I'll second that. All right, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Thank you. All right. Well, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, District Attorney Kevin Steele. And he's come out tonight to our meeting to commend three of our police officers. And I'll turn it over to him. All right, up here is fine. I don't like to turn my back on anybody, but um, <laughs> you got my back? <laughs> All right, let's stay in front of the, front of the chief here. Um, so so uh, let, me, let me start out with, with, with saying um, we have, an outstanding um, law enforcement community in Montgomery County. And uh, one of the things that I've seen over the years is um, not enough attention to the great things that they are doing in our, in our community. Um, so every year uh, I get to do law enforcement commendations. Um, we had a, a glitch uh, in the commendation ceremony um, and uh, so I get to do it here with all of you and um, with um, all the elected officials. And I'm, I'm really appreciative of you having me, uh, me out here tonight to, to join you on this. Um, so um, Steve Dice, Michael Sheehan, and uh, John Oliveira, uh, come on up. All right, so uh, February 2019, um, there was an unanswered call that came out, uh, and, uh, or a, a 911 call that got dropped. And uh, the officers through the record management system were able to track the home where the call came from. Uh, the dispatcher uh, thought that they heard um, a potential stabbing um, going on. Um, so these officers um, and other officers responded uh, to the scene, um, uh, address I believe on Green Street, uh, and when they arrived, um, they saw a man um, that had two women, he had a knife, he had a box cutter. Um, when they observed him, uh, they were able to see that he took the women that were visibly um, not beyond frightened um, down to uh, a basement area. Um, the officers were able to uh, eventually engage him in conversation. Um, and while they engaged him in, in conversation, uh, the other officers were able to get the two women who were bleeding and cut um, out of the basement um, and get them to safety. Then, after engaging the officers, or engaging the, the, the defendant for a, a further amount of time, they were able to um, get him in a position where they used uh, non-lethal force uh, on him um, to apprehend him. Um, and it wasn't easy. Um, he made it very difficult on the officers. Um, 
this heroic actions by these officers saved two women, um, did not call and cause any permanent damage to the defendant, and they all left um, uninjured. Um, that is quality police work from outstanding police officers, and I hope that this community shares how proud I am of these individuals and the job that they do every day. Um, and you look like you were about to applaud, and you should, all right? All right. Thank you, District Attorney. We have a check to present tonight, uh, the proceeds of a GoFundMe account that was opened up during, uh, oh, can you hear me now? Okay. <clears throat> no? <laughs> it should be on. All right. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, we have a check to present tonight to the Open Hearth Foundation, and they're doing relief work down in Montclair and Port Providence uh, with the folks who were victimized by the uh, Ida flooding. And the check amount is for $44,936.45. Uh, part of that is from a GoFundMe page that the township opened up, and the other part is from a uh, concert that the Schuylkill Canal Association uh, sponsored in Phoenixville to, to help the flood victims. So anyway, the check is yours, and uh, we thank you for your good work. say it's in partnership with other organizations as well. We're just helping to distribute the funds. And Karen Williams, I asked her to come today because she really has been boots on the ground making sure that she's visited everybody that, um, that needed to be seen and um, is able to help us with, with the referral so we can distribute these funds quickly. Great. So thank you. Yep. Thank you. Yep. All right. Thank you guys very much. And now I think I can go back to my chair. Thank <laughs> you. 
have one one more item before we get to public comments. And uh, the night of the Ida flooding, we had a tremendous amount of rescue work go on down there. And uh, we had many, many other fire companies from three counties, from Chester, Delaware, and Montgomery County, come and assist us in those rescues. So I would like to read a sample of a letter that uh, Chief Dan Kerrigan sent out to the fire chief of uh, Ashton Fire uh, Department, and uh, Ashton is way down in Chester County, almost to this, the town of Chester, and uh, <clears throat> and this is just a sample, and then I'll read the names of the 24 fire companies. Chief Evans, beginning on September 1st, 2021, and continuing for several days after, Upper Providence Township was severely impacted by the remnants of Hurricane Ida. Our township saw record-breaking river and creek levels of over 25 feet after receiving nearly 12 inches of rain and downstream flow from northern and western counties. The catastrophic conditions resulted in our emergency response capabilities and the emergency management efforts becoming quickly overwhelmed. To put the severity of this event in context, I'd like to provide you with some details on the emergency response efforts. In the first 24 to 36 hours of the incident, 161 adults, 34 children, and 42 animals were rescued or evacuated. Many were in grave peril, resorting to climbing to rooftops and second floor rooms as rapidly rising floodwaters threatened many lives. In total, 203 structures were affected, 191 homes and 12 businesses. Upper Providence Township Department of Emergency Services personnel, with the assistance from many mutual aid departments, responded to 113 incidents in the first 48 hours of the event. 71 swift water rescues, four flood assessments, and 38 other calls for service, including gas leaks, fire alarms, investigations, and EMS assists. Mutual aid, mutual aid assistance was received from 21 different agencies between 1,500 hours on September 1st and 1,500 hours on September 2nd. The Ashton Fire Department was instrumental in the success of our operation. Your personnel acted with bravery and professionalism throughout the incident, and the fact that no one lost their life during this incident is due in no small part to the willingness of your personnel to go above and beyond to place our residents' lives ahead of your own. On behalf of our elected officials, township administration, and with my personal gratitude and sincere appreciation, please accept our thanks for your assistance during this catastrophic event. And do not hesitate to reach out if I can ever be of assistance to you or your agency. Yours in service, Dan Kerrigan, Chief of Fire and Emergency Services, Upper Providence. And uh, I'm just going to quickly read through these organizations that assisted um, our very own Black Rock Fire Company, President Joe Lacassau, uh, Valley Forge Baptist Church, Pastor Scott Wendell, Collegeville Fire Company, Chief Brian Kuklinski, uh, Limerick Fire Department, Chief Ken Schuler, Lower Providence Fire Department, Chief Jim Lentz, Upper Marion Fire Department, Chief Dennis Rubin, Phoenixville Fire Department, Chief John Buckwalter, Pottstown Fire Department, Chief Frank Han, Lower Providence Community Ambulance, Chief Chris Reynolds, Friendship Ambulance, Principal George Giliano, uh, Ashton Township Fire Department, Chief Mike Evans, Bordertown Area Fire and Rescue, Chief Greg Dietrich, uh, Cheltenham Township Emergency Management, Ken Hellendahl, and City of Chester Bureau of Fire, Commissioner William Rigby, Montgomery County Department Emergency of Emergency Services, Michael Vest, Montgomery County Incident Support Team, Bill Messerschmidt, uh, Limerick Township Emergency Management, Sean Schmelz, uh, the Office of the Mayor of, of the Borough of Phoenixville, Mayor Peter Urschler, um, Middletown Fire Company, Chief Duke Messino, uh, Montgomery County USAR Task Force, Joe Dishler, New Hanover Police Department, Chief Kevin McKeon, uh, w, uh, PA Fish and Boat Commission, WCO Robert Bonney and Sergeant Ronaldo Ivancho, uh, Phoenixville Office, Office of Emergency Management, EMC Karen Williams, and Tinicum Township Fire Company, Chief Mike Golden. And that's not an exhaustive list. There were other uh, 
other uh, companies involved and other organizations involved in the days and weeks following that assist that continue to assist in uh, in helping our residents in the, that part of the township. So we just want to say a thank you from this board, and I wanted to put that on the public record. And with that, we'll uh, open it up for public comments. I'm going to ask that you come forward, state your name and address at the microphone, and uh, please treat it. Apply, Please try to keep your comments to three minutes or less. Thank you. My name is Arlen Bell, and I have a comment on the PD Garden. I can either do it now or wait until you hear the presentation. Which would you prefer? Wait. OK, my concern is right now, the way everything is designed, the roadway that goes into PD Garden is going to be having large um, tractor trailers going along it. It's not a regular roadway is actually elevated above our development. And I've requested they figure out some kind of way to reduce the noise. I live across the, like, across the meadows. I live in the meadows. And I can hear trucks now. When you hear the beeping, you know, when they back, the backup uh, noises that tr big trucks make sometimes, I can hear that across the development. So I'm just asking them to figure out a way. I'm not an engineer. And I'm not a lawyer. I know the Montgomery County uh, recommended that they put in a second entrance because this is so far. So if they actually decide to do that, can they come up with a different way to come in? Uh, we're next to Global now. The Global trucks come in from behind Global, so we don't hear them. The cars come in, and those roadways are much lower. They're about parallel to ours. So in any, all the approvals, you cannot see the elevations that we're looking at because their roadway is elevated above our development in many places. That's all. Thank you. Do we have any any other public comments this evening? All right, then we'll move along. Uh, executive session report. There are no executive were no executive sessions held to report on. Uh, approval of the bill list. We have a fairly large bill list this month, and that's related to construction costs with the new Emergency Services Center. Um, if there are no questions, I will entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the bill list from October 14th, 2021 to November 8th, 2021 in the amount of $3,215,846.54. I'll second that motion. All right, I have a motion and a second to approve the bill list from the period October 14th, 2021 to November 8th, 2021 in the amount of $3,215,846.54. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. Okay, approval of minutes. We have no minutes uh, ready for approval tonight, so we'll move on to the public hearing. There are no public hearings scheduled for this evening, and now we're ready to move into old business. And the first item under old business is consider adopting resolution 2021-52, granting preliminary plan land development approval for PD Home and Garden 500 Opportunity Way. Good evening, Ed Mullen and Tom Lidgate uh, here on behalf of the applicant. Uh, you may recall you saw this at tentative, and um, this is a 10.2 acre piece of ground where we're proposing to build a 100,000 square foot building to house PD homes and gardens. They are presently located in the township, but they're operating out of two buildings, and the, uh, the owner of PD would like to own his own building. Consequently, that's why we're doing this. Um, what he does is he imports things from Asia and their decorative home accessories, and then he distributes them to distributors and wholesales them. There is no retail sale at this property. The traffic basically is two large trucks a day coming in and two or three small trucks, like FedEx type trucks. There are 10 loading docks. The business operates six days a week from 7.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. There's no manufacturing. There's no hazardous materials. The only exterior lighting is security lighting, and they anticipate having 23 employees. For a building of that size, it's a really light um, impact. We 
went before the Planning Commission, and in your package, I'm sure you see that they recommended that we apply, comply with all the review letters, which we're willing to do, with the exception of the county review letter, which was duplicitous of what everybody else had already done. Talk about landscaping, Jeff did the landscaping. They talked about putting a tr our sidewalk to connecting it to Arlen Bell's community, which certainly she wouldn't want. Now, I do have some good news. Let me just mention one thing. We do have only one waiver request, and that is because the site is so big <coughs> that we changed the scale in the plans from one inch equals 100 to one inch equals 120. It's the only waiver. Um, we have good news for uh, Ms. Bell, and that is that we went out and we looked at the situation, and to the extent that we can, what we're going to do, and it's quite expensive, we're going to remove all the trees that are there now that we just put in, and we're going to elevate the berm by two feet, and then we're going to replant the trees. We can't go really any higher than that, because you imagine the berm, higher you go, more do you get, and we run out of room. But we think it's a real significant concession to our neighbors, considering the fact that there's only going to be two trucks a day. Um, and with that, we ask, answer any question you have and ask for approval. I appreciate that. You responded to Ms. Bell's comments at the Planning Commission last week. I, I appreciate that. All right. Does anybody have any questions? So you said there was 10 loading docks. Is it 10 loading docks? Yes. Okay, but then there's only two large trucks that would need to be unloaded per day. Correct. Well, they'll come in and they may not unload them that day. Okay. What they'll do, they can sit there for a week before they get unloaded. Gotcha. That's why you have 10. I just wasn't sure why the extra loading docks. And then three smaller trucks, like FedEx trucks. FedEx type or UPS type. Okay. And, and so considering 100,000 square feet, that could be a huge occupant. So it's mostly to store things, I would take it, because it doesn't seem like things are coming in and out much. 23 employees, no, yeah. no retail. Um, you know, it's, it's really just space to store everything. <clears throat> is it here, John, at the very raising? Yeah. This is where they're going to put the uh, people on the dock here. Yeah. They want this space for the residents. Bill, I have a question. So the extra two feet, is that, it, would you think that's considerable enough to cut off some of the noise? I'd have to ask, I haven't seen where this two feet's going to be or anything, Ed. I mean, where are you proposing this the change? The entire length of the road, where there, right now there's a behind, row of trees that we're planting. Behind Global, we're essentially. Take, yep, we're going to take those trees out, elevate the berm by two feet, and replace the trees certainly will help you know i'm not a sound engineer <laughs> you know so i can't speak to you know how much it will attenuate the sounds but you know it can't hurt you know that type of thing and and i understand the comment that you can only raise it so high because then the berm goes away i mean you can't keep raising something there's it doesn't work <laughs> you know you only raise it so much are there any other questions or comments nope I'll entertain a motion. I'll make the motion to approve resolution 2021-52 uh, to grant preliminary land development approval for PD home and garden located at 500 Opportunity Way. I'll second that. All right, I have a motion and a second to adopt resolution 2021-52, granting preliminary land development approval for PD home and garden located at 500 Opportunity Way. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you and good night. All right. Our next item of business is uh, consider adopting resolution 2021-53, granting tentative land, devel land development approval for Foley property, Toll Brothers, Rittenhouse Road. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Here we go. Yeah. My name is Allison Fritches. I'm pinch hitting tonight for my colleague, Allison Zara, who had a conflict to represent Toll. With me is Brian, um, who you've seen here a few times before on the Foley Tract. 
I'm sure. I'm sorry, you're Allison too? Fritches, yes. Okay. Two Allisons. They spelled the same. And they're spelled the same, both with a Y. The unusual way. Great. Um, so we're here tonight to head of sketch plan application. Um, as you know, this tract is now zoned R2. We're proposing 54 single family detached lots um, in accordance with the cluster development provisions. Um, we received a unanimous recommendation from the Planning Commission on November 3rd for this development. Um, there's going to be 15.1 acres of open space included with this. Um, we had a few comments from the Planning Commission regarding a sidewalk and or trail or trail connection north of Rittenhouse Road. Um, we decided to do with that, and Brian can speak a little bit to this as well as to discuss with our engineer, do some engineering, and see what we can do what's more appropriate for um, that area, whether it be a sidewalk, whether it be a trail. Also, we discussed um, road widening, um, and that's going to be dependent on the McMahon's um, determination regarding the tra traffic impact on how much we can widen, widen that road. So those were two of the uh, comments of the Planning Commission. Otherwise, um, there wasn't much uh, discussion. Again, this is only tentative sketch plan. We don't have any waivers right now, obviously, because we're not at preliminary or final um, application. And with that, this Brian, do you want to talk a little bit about the, the trail connections? Uh, hello, everybody. Brian here from Toll Brothers. Um, as, as, I'll, thank you. Um, as Allison mentioned, um, the discussion about how we connect the two northern pods. You know, we have trail connections going across Valley View. We're going to have a connection from the south parcel across Rittenhouse to be determined what the, the makeup of that is. And there's connectivity one way or another all the way around, but a comment was the two north parcels should connect. Um, there's some environmentally sensitive areas there. So we, we yes. Oh. <laughs> Ooh, does that work? All right, there. So this connection point right here. Um, there's been discussions about sidewalk on Rittenhouse. We've got all these trails trying to avoid kind of redundancy with sidewalk and trail. So what is the best use of this connection right here? So as we get a little bit deeper into engineering, which we're in right now, um, I think the discussion is I would coordinate with Gilmore and McMahon to see what makes sense for everybody. Making sure there's safe passage between the, the three parcels we can get across Rittenhouse Road and just what makes sense for everybody. Could you trace out the could you trace out the trail connections that will be added as a result? Ooh, that's a really good one. So we will have a crossing at Valley View Drive that connects to the existing township trail. Andrews on the south side. Okay. Um, we've already agreed that'll be some kind of flashing mechanism to cross Valley View right there for safety. Great. The trail up here, the existing township trail north of the parcel, will be bringing it down kind of connecting through here, tying around the end of our development and also connecting into the development. So that's new. Um, I should have flipped, I should have done it the other way. But on the south parcel, as this is existing, we'll connect it across our frontage on the south parcel. It'll enter into the development. Um, I think uh, uh, one of Mr. Gingman's comments where we might have some redundancy in trails. So our rec recommendation was to delete this trail to the back and just leave this trail here, and this will connect all the way through down to Lewis Road. There's that South Lewis Road. Okay. So the only thing we're missing, right, is the connection between the A, B pod and the C pod on the north side, and we just don't know how we're going to come down that big hill. I know what you're talking about in there. Yeah, correct. The, the one thing that's, I talked to Anthony Valencia from McMahon about this connection point right here. Uh, wh what is that needed? We talked about, you know, whether there's an area of refuge in an island or is it just kind of, I call it piano keys, but I think they call it a continental crossing where you can yep. just walk here. Yep. Um, try to figure that out. But again, the real question is just we need some further engineering and we'll okay. do what makes sense. It's just to connect these two portions on the north side of Rittenhouse. <clears throat> Are there any other questions or comments? No, just the fact that you're going to connect all of that together. You just haven't decided on how this is all going to come about. That's all. I, I know there was comments about, you know, sidewalk, whether it's required on both sides, and then if you're going to have a trail next to a sidewalk, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. So, again, we'll coordinate with township staff, which makes sense, what makes sense to that area. 
I get it. Thank you. Okay. All right. If there's no further questions or comments, I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to uh, adopt resolution 2021-53 to grant tentative plan land development approval to toll mid-Atlantic uh, for the Foley property located on Rittenhouse Road. I'll second. All right. I have a motion and a second to adopt resolution 2021-53 granting tentative land develop tentative plan land development approval for Foley property, Toll Brothers, Rittenhouse Road. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. All right. Now we come to the new business portion of the meeting. And I see Ms. Mazzatelli is out in the audience. And she's going to give us a little uh, briefing on the FEMA hazardous mitigation grant program that we're operating in the Port Providence area right now. Thank you very much for having me, first of all. And I want to commend your township for really taking a very active role in this really horrible disaster. I've been doing this for 20 years, and your community is one of the first I've ever seen to mobilize as quickly as you have. I have to give a lot of credit to Brian for reaching out to Pima right away to really try to find relief for the people in this community because it was devastating. And, you know, I've been on board, I think, less than a month, and Brian has gone above and beyond, and Jeff and the engineers to really get this process moving, get everybody on board. Um, so I just want to thank you for having faith in people like Brian and your community because there are a lot of communities that are not like you, and you deserve to be commended. So. On behalf of everyone, I hope they feel the same way. Thank so, you. So, I just wanted to let you know, as of today, between Brian's hard work and my hard work, we have received 48 total applications for this potential um, FEMA acquisition project. It is falling under the um, HMGP program, which is the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. Um, there's two different components. We're, this is actually falling into COVID money first, which is $25 million. And then there's also Ida money, which will be in early 2022. Last week, we had 20 appraisals completed. Um, the appraisals will actually be sent to the township this week. So Brian will receive them. He will be distributing, distributing them to the residents um, by email, or they can come pick them up. We also have another 24 appraisals scheduled for tomorrow and Wednesday. And then we have four little stragglers who will probably end up um, having appraisals done next week. So that'll be a total of 48. Um, so everyone should have appraisals um, after this week within the next two weeks. So by the end of the month, everyone should have appraisals. And Brian and I have not discussed, but I think December 7th really should be kind of the drop dead date for people to make a decision once they receive their appraisals, whether they want to stay in the program or they don't want to stay in the program. The deadline for this application is January 7th. Um, so there may be some people who drop off. Um, so what will happen is this is a 100% share program. It will be covered 100% by the federal government. Um, each person is having a pre-flood appraisal done by an independent appraisal who I've actually worked with in another community on a buyout program. So he's working with each of the homeowners that if the inside of their homes are not put together, they're kind of filling him in on what could have been new, what kind of been new. Um, so that should hopefully help people. The every 100% of the costs are covered in this program. So that would be closing costs, project management for someone like me to actually apply for this grant and then see it through to project management. Um, I also wanted to let you know that any administrative time that Brian or your staff spends on this project, I will put in as pre-award costs as well as the appraisal costs will be pre-award. And then going forward when the grant is awarded, any administrative time also could be recouped. You know, I just ask for them to kind of generally keep their time along with my time. Um, engineering costs, demolition costs, everything is covered under this program. It should hopefully be a net, net zero, no taxpayer money to be put into this project. And I've actually, in the 20 years I've done this, not a dime has ever been paid for the taxpayers. We've always made it net, net. Um, 
So basically on January 7th, all the applications will go to Pima. I hope to have it done maybe a week or so earlier. Pima will review everything. They will make the recommendations to FEMA. Pima is a great um, partner with this community. They want to see success. They want to see this project happen. So we're very lucky they're going to help us craft the best possible application. And it, it's going to be a good application. We have a lot of substantially damaged homes, which is very high priority. So once the application goes to Pima, it then goes off to FEMA probably within about a, six weeks. Um, disaster programs usually move a little faster than the non-disaster, so we would hope to hear something from FEMA within six months of January 7th. So I'm saying to people maybe midsummer we should pretty much have an answer. And then from there, you, unfortunately, you have the slowness of the federal government in getting grant agreements out. But we're looking at probably a year from now. Um, we've explained this to everyone. We've, you know, people have been asking, should we fix up our homes? Should we not? You know, it's kind of a personal question, but I would like to see people back in their homes, you know, in a livable condition. So that's pretty much it so far where we are. We'll have some downtime in the late winter, early spring, but I'll continue to update you know, as we know in anything. So if anyone has any questions for me. Just, uh, just. Sorry, just a quick question. The, um, um, those people that, uh, uh, those people that decide to stay in the program, uh, is it 100% is of the chance that these people will all uh, uh, end up with the buyout? Anybody that puts their home in for the buyout will, is guaranteed that they're going to be bought, purchased. Look, I can never make guarantees because it is the federal government. Pardon me? Yeah, I can't make guarantees because it is the federal government. But what I will do is we will put together, we have to do two applications because Pima said 40, if we had 40, 40 is too many in one project. So we would do two separate applications. I will submit what is called a cost effective application, which means that. FEMA sees this as a benefit to buy out these homes. So as long as it's a cost-effective application, which we will do, I've never submitted one that is not, and this is where Pima helps me. Once that application goes in, it's cost-effective, and FEMA makes their initial decision, it's approved. So they wouldn't drop anyone out. That's part of this crafting the best application possible, which I'm, you know, very good at doing. So yes, once you've committed and you want to be in, you're in. And hopefully these homeowners will stay in because we don't want homeowners dropping out after it's become cost effective because then the cost effectiveness starts dropping as houses start yeah. to drop out. So I, we've kind I just of had want, this discussion. I, I don't want the people to get into the program and then Somebody said, well, okay, well, FEMA's not going to buy your property or take your property or anything. No, so if you, you are interested and you put in your application and we put in an application on behalf of the community, <coughs> the application is, is in. And these disaster programs are a lot, more, a lot less competitive. It's only the state of Pennsylvania. So money is being allocated just for this disaster. So you have a much better chance of approval on these projects, yes. Okay. I have a question on the map on Needle. It looks like it's like two homes and then a blank row and then <coughs> one on the end. So how does that work if it's not, if they're not all in a row? Um, I mean, we've kind of, this is really a township question maybe for Brian, um, you know, what you're going to do afterwards because it would become open space. Specifically those between, uh, where you referred to on the map on Needle Street, they actually front on Walnut, however, uh, the Two that are uh, contiguous are two halves of a twin. So FEMA would, if, if both halves, if the owners of both halves of those twins stay in the program, um, FEMA would buy that out. But for example, on the, on the right side where Needle Street turns back into Walnut, um, the applicant for that last home, that's the right half of a twin, and the left half, the owner who owns the left side, has not submitted an application. So in that case, FEMA will not fund that particular buyout project. Mm -hmm. And that's again what you know. Susan needs to have two bags, you know, two piles of applications, yeah. and try to do, you know, work her magic to make them both cost effective. And we're hoping with a little time, because this we can submit two separate applications. We could do one now and then do Ida, which we don't even know when that's opening. So a lot of times you'll see people who are, I don't want to do this, and then they it's they they realize, oh, maybe I want to get in. So we're going to work on maybe some of the twin owners to see if you know. And it's unfortunate that you can't take one twin in yeah. one side and not the other, but, yeah. That doesn't work. 
Thank you, Susan. I just want to point out on tax dollars, FEMA and PEMA are funding this, so it's federal tax dollars and state tax dollars, but no local tax dollars, no. right? No, no right. local match whatsoever. Absolutely. It's all so, one big tax 100%. bill, though, in the end, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> no, so, I agree. No, I hear you. All right. No, I would. My guess, my best guess would be we would actually, the project would be, grant agreements would be signed, homeowners would be signed on, we would get our advances and then we'd start the closings and, you know, buying out the houses, you know, I'd say within a year. I mean, so, I will get a better timeline, unfortunately, as we start to move from January forward. So demolition would occur after that? Yes, it, okay. demolition has to occur within 90 days of settlement. So these would have to be done in groups because as we're finding with everyone now, maybe in a year it'll lighten up a little bit. It's just because of the volume and the contractors who are so busy. So, you know, you might end up having to do a couple houses at a time. But I can always get extensions on that. I, want, I would rather see people say, you know what, I'm ready to move on. I, I would like my money. I bought another house. I can manage that part of it if we go beyond 90 days. But it's ideal. But we're doing that now in Upper Southampton. We're past 90 days because the demolition contractors are all very busy, so. I have a quick question. Is there other requirements that we need to know past that 90-day demolition from the federal government? Or um, like the only, Yeah, I mean, the only requirement is trying to get that house down within 90 days and having the land, you know, the land restored to its natural state and then the project, you know, the, the uh, properties would be maintenance by the township. So that's really it. It's deeded to the township. It is open, passive open space, publicly accessed. So you could do what you want with it at that point. Rain gardens, community gardens. We are, I've talked to Sarah Sato from the, the rec department and I'm gonna grab one of Bill's landscape architects, probably more towards January, but we're gonna come up with a plan to, to um, re-naturalize these parcels. Something that's a, a low maintenance. I was talking to Tom Broadbelt the other day and he goes, I don't wanna have to mow you know, this yard, then go down four houses, and then move that yard. So we wanna re-naturalize everything with, with native plants and a, a nice riparian buffer and things like that. Our plan is to sit down again with Bill's landscape architect and come up with sort of like a white paper on, on exactly how we're going to do that so that on each parcel as they come up, because it's not all going to be, you know, on once the grant is done, it may be over, I think you said three years yeah. potentially for some of these, so that we can have a plan to move forward with each parcel as it, as it comes into the township. I also mentioned to Jeff and Brian that uh, PICO has an open space grant for $10,000, and I secured that grant for Upper Southampton Township. They had a six home buyout, and they want, they're gonna use the money for the same purposes because it actually borders on op uh, township open space. They were gonna kind of naturalize just to reduce the maintenance. So there's always those options out there, and that's a very under underutilized program. So it's another way to use the land properly and you know, recharge water with less maintenance. You, you may have already told us, and maybe I didn't hear That's it, okay. but if I'm, a, if I'm a homeowner down there and, and I decide to go with the buyout, what kind of time frame am I looking at before I get my buyout, before you guys come in and say, here's your money, see ya? Okay, so I'll give you a perfect example. Say the grant agreements are on their way from FEMA. They will give us notice, they'll, they'll say they're on their way, they'll be here in a couple weeks. Everything is digital, which is great. It moves things a lot faster. You approve it at your uh, township board meeting. Um, at that point, when I know the grant agreements are on their way, I will request an advance for the money for 50% of the project so that we could say if there's, you know, 20 homes in one application, I will ask for an advance to buy out 10 homes. As soon as that advance hits the bank account, which should be within about six weeks, we could start scheduling closings as soon as the grant agreement is signed and we know the money is on the way. And at least give people notice to say, you know, start looking for a home. We're also going to have homeowner meetings because I want to be on their timeline. I, I'm not push, we're not pushing anyone out. This is to make people comfortable, make them you know, be able to find a home that's a right fit for them, financially a fit for them. We have three years to do this project. Someone might say, you know what, 
I can't do this till June. I have kids in school. No problem. You know, we'll start lining people up and scheduling people so it's on their timeline. And if someone says, I want to go tomorrow and the money's in the bank account, we could have a title report done within two weeks and they could have a check and we can sit down at a closing table. So it moves very quickly in this situation once okay. we're ready. Okay. So I, I decide I'm in the program. How long before this all comes about? I mean, what, what, am I, what timeline is it, can I expect to be out of my house by March, April? Of, of 2022, no. I would say one year from now would one, be. So and, and I'm going to give you the worst case scenario, just because I, I don't want to get. I get it, and I and I, pre, I thank you for yeah. all thank you for all that you've done, but I, I guess as a as somebody who's living in a in a half completed house because I don't want to put any more money into it, um, how how long you know I guess that's what I'm getting at. Do I have to live there for a year now? Yes, but we've had meetings with homeowners, and that is one question that a lot of people have brought up. What do I do? Do I fix up my home? Yeah. It's, I mean, listen, I am a person who reduces, reuses, recycles. I am not the kind of person to waste. I have a hard time giving this advice, and this advice does come from Pima. We would rather see people fix up their homes to livable condition so that they could be back in their home because it could take a year. And, and use you know the bare minimum don't put very fancy finishes in you know unfortunately the house would be demolished we're also telling people if you're moving back in your home and you're fixing it you know you can take your washer and dryer you can take your stoves you know let's be reasonable but i don't want somebody to be out of their house if they can't afford to live somewhere else there are other people who said we're not going back and they can afford to not go back right. so it's really a personal choice and another um discussion that has come up is if people receive flood insurance proceeds from their claims, they either have to put it back into their house and show the receipts prior to closing, or if they decide to keep the money and walk away from the house, then we have to deduct yeah. that from the proceeds. And, and we've been very clear with everyone, and that is a personal choice that, you know, and that's okay. So. Yeah. Thank you. Know, you. How far does this program Go, when you mentioned helping, do you help people find other homes or that's entirely on them? That's on them. So that's why I'm saying I'm, you know, the ideal situation is for someone to get the maximum amount from their home, from the sale, so that they can move on to another home. And, and that may be the decision or the deciding factor for a lot of people to not do this buyout, to say, you know what, I really can't find something. So we just want to give people the option, you know, to be safe in the future. Any other awesome. Well, thank you for everything you're doing. I appreciate it. And Listen, I have team. a passion for this. You know, I really, I don't love buyouts. I mean, I do a lot of elevations too, but to see what happened and what could have happened had someone not been ready, it's very scary. You know, and, and, and these people, to go through this again, it just, it causes a lot of anxiety. And it's just better, you know, for the township, for your, you know, emergency services. You know, it, it reduces a lot of risk and a lot of, you know, safety issues in the future, hopefully, so. And hopefully people will be safer, so. Thank you, and thank you, Brian, and everyone else, and we will keep you updated on what's I, happening. I have, I have one more question. Sure. The people that haven't bought out, let's just say in the future, and of course, we're gonna have more flooding. We talked about that initially in your yes. very beginning. You said climate change and all that. Would, would you do this again in this community, let's say in 10 years if we needed it? Would, would, would you do another buyout? Well, would, would FEMA and Pima would be as receptive? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. FEMA and NFIP, the, the, po the point of this mitigation program is to prevent future claims for damage and to prevent, you know, the loss of life, injury, emergency services. It's really to make sure that the floodplain is restored to the floodplain if you can. Even if you elevate homes, you're not completely erasing the risk. Right. You know, so yeah, no, absolutely. I work with a lot of communities like Yardley Borough. They have been applying for a grant after grant after grant since um, I think it was back to 2004. And mm -hmm. FEMA wants to see these communities continue in these mitigation programs, whether they're buyouts or elevations. So it makes it a more resilient community. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Have a good night. Susan, may I just yeah. one thing? Could you elaborate just a little bit on the difference between this 
program that's available through the presidential declaration and the typical FMA application that we might yeah. submit on an annual I, basis? Yeah, Brian knows about this. I, I actually just submitted um, a elevation project um, on a non-disaster grant today, which was due. Um, the, every year, FEMA has a program called FMA, which is Flood Mitigation Assistance. It's a non-disaster program that is available every single year. And it's a nationally competitive program. So you don't have to be in a current disaster, but you have to fit a certain criteria. You either need to be a repetitive loss home or a severe repetitive loss home, which means you have to hold NFIP flood insurance and you have to have at least two flood claims within a 10-year period to, at, to even be qualified for this program. So um, I apply every year. This program has become so incredibly competitive. It's actually like winning the lottery. I, I mean, I have a community in Yardley Borough. I applied three times for the same grant and was finally awarded after three times. So it's very difficult to get approved for this program, not because it's not a great application, but because there's so little money. In 2020, um, $350 billion in applications and only $70 million in awards. So I don't like saying this, but this disaster coming is actually a very good thing because there's more money available and only competitive in this state for relief to homeowners in this situation. In a non-disaster situation, I don't know that you would be able to get through a 40 home acquisition project. So, at, you know, if you can find a silver lining, it will bring people relief with these programs, the IDA money, the COVID money. Um, so it, it is a good thing for the communities. So. Thank you. I just wanted the board to have an appreciation yeah. for how difficult it might be in the future oh, under yeah. a non-disaster declaration well, to, to obtain grant applications for this. Yeah, that's, that's my thought, yeah. And that, you know, Brian is a perfect example of submitting a couple applications on behalf of this community and not being awarded. It takes several times. To, and uh, believe it or not, these HMGP applications are actually a little easier. They're paper applications, which, you know, so it can, you know, once you get it in, it's, it's easy, so. A lot of time consuming, but thank you. Thank you, system. Susan, and thank, thank you, you for, for your, having me. And thank I you for your back. patience with us and with all of our residents. I've seen you in your meetings. You're doing fantastic work. <laughs> thank, thank you, you very much. It's a complex program. It's a yeah. lot to Well, explore. and I have to tell you, you have great residents. You yeah. know, I mean, the residents have been through a lot, and I know we've had people with tears and people frustrated, and, you know, I'm here to work with all of you to, you know, help make them whole And at the end of the day. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night. All right, our next item under new business is consider adopting resolution 2021-54, declaring the board's intention to follow the schedules and procedures for disposition of records as set forth in the municipal records manual as amended. The, uh, the, uh, yeah, it's, it's a very exciting item. It's the, the state historical commission has a, a schedule, the municipal records retention schedule for uh, every conceivable type of document uh, broken into chapters and it tells you how long you have to keep each type of document and then you, what you're doing is you're telling them that you will follow their manual this resolution is simply saying you'll follow the manual it doesn't restate all this the entire schedule which is 40 pages long um, but we do have the schedule and is available for inspection and it's also available easily online through the historic commission for anyone who is looking for something to get them to sleep tonight. <laughs> we, we dispose of records all the time, don't we? Don't we dispose of records every year? Yeah, oh, yeah, because, I mean, it all started, you know, maybe more so when records took up more physical space, uh, but you didn't want to keep them longer than you had to, so you didn't have to get whole other buildings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are we, uh, Tim, are we uh, uh, following this already? Is this something that's pro forma or? We have to actually make changes. Cheryl's making us very. We, uh, I can. We. Yeah. You have. You have, a version of this in place, and I think that she wanted to draft this to say, so that it's one of those self-reauthenticating because you're saying you'll now always follow it. As, okay. where before you said you'll follow the so-and-so edition, mm -hmm. and now you're saying you'll just follow it generally. You got it. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. What we're trying to do is maybe get in the habit of each uh, reorganization meeting. Do this once once a year. And okay. So. Do we do we still do we still have a lot of records over uh, over Iron, Iron Mountain? Mountain? Yeah, we're trying to we're slowly but surely. What one box here, two boxes here, 
as we get a right to know request. Once we get a box, retrieve it, we never send it back, we digitize it. So it's okay. just a, a very slow process. <laughs> Maybe in the next 15 years, no, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. Hopefully sooner than that. All right. <coughs> I'll entertain a motion. I move to consider adopting resolution 2021-54 to declare the board's intention to follow the schedules and procedures for records disposition as set forth in the Pennsylvania Municipal Records Manual as amended. I'll second a motion. All right, I have a motion to adopt resolution 2051-54 declaring the board's intention to follow the schedules and procedures for disposition of records as set forth in the municipal records manual as amended. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries, thank you. All right, uh, our next agenda item is consider adopting resolution 2021-55 authorizing sewer connection benefit assessment in the amount of $10,000 for the Dale Drive sanitary sewer main extension. Someone want to speak to that? Sure, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the property owner approached the township on Lewis, South Lewis Road uh, asking for public sewer, and we looked at it with Tom Broadbelt, Public Works Department, and determined that a small extension along uh, South Lewis Road um, from Dale Drive would serve this property, and this resolution before you is the standard $10,000 benefit assessment You know that you've passed in previous years uh, for each property that would be fronting that sewer. At this time, there's only one property, but the sewer is being set up to be easily extended uh, uh, to ad additional properties up that road at a future date. Um, the property owner did grant an easement uh, to the township uh, for the sewer extension so that we could get to their property and through their property to the next property also. So that was very beneficial for the township. Uh, I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to adopt resolution 2021-55, authorizing a sewer connection benefit assessment in the amount of $10,000 for the Dale Drive Sanitary Sewer Main Extension. I'll second that. I have a motion, a second to, a motion and a second to adopt resolution 2021-55, authorizing a sewer connection benefit assessment in the amount of $10,000 for the Dale Drive sanitary sewer main extension. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion carries, thank you. All right, the next item on our agenda, consider approving an intermunicipal agreement for sanitary sewer collection and conveyance with Perkyoman Township. <clears throat> this is a, a situation where there's a, a two, lot, two lots being developed in Perkyoman Township and the developer has contingent approval, the contingency being being able to hook up uh, the sewer for those two properties to, directly to the Upper Providence system. Um, there's no problem with it. Um, Bill's office doesn't have any objection to it conceptually. Um, it, the, the, the only issue, and, and this, the agreement that you have is the intermunicipal agreement between Perkium and, and you that you would control uh, that flow. The current anticipation would be that the um, township you would pay per human and then you would bill the, the resident to get recouped for the money that detail is still something that we're working out um, the legally the one concern that presents itself is that when you present if you provide service outside of your municipal boundary you subject yourself to possible PUC jurisdiction and, and that's something you really don't want um, there are a few lots elsewhere in the township that have a similar arrangement for some Royersford residents very, very long time ago. And just leave that sit and you know as it is. But in terms of this new um, relationship, what I would not want to happen is to have the PUC for any reason um, exercise jurisdiction. And I don't think it would, I think one of the things that really helps us is um, that the, the, there are lateral connections. There's the, the township, we're not putting mains in Perkyoman Township. You're not expanding your service territory, really. You're just accommodating two homes. Um, but there is some, some case law out there that you know gives pause, and I had intended to speak to um, the PUC attorney I work with on these issues today, but he wasn't available today. So what I would ask you to do is just to um, approve the agreement subject to any final revisions uh, regarding the 
the structure of it. But if, if I make any major changes to it, then I would bring it back to you and, you know, and circulate it. Right now, we're just hoping to tweak it to, to address this concern. Don't, don't we have this elsewhere? Don't, we've had the situation in trap, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. we, we did something. Uh, the, re the reality is, well, you do. You have it in a couple of places. And the reality is, so does a, a, lot, of pe a lot of people do. I think, um, I think that um, there has been an awareness. The, the, the PUC has become very aggressive in recent years in taking control or, or of, of systems on this basis, um, a hugely litigated case in, in Pittsburgh. Um, there, are, there are legislators who now want the PUC to regulate every system uh, and remove this language about going past your jurisdictional boundary and just regulate you right off the bat. Um, so it's a, the environment is such that I don't want to be too casual. This is not a big deal, it's two lots. Um, I, I said to their attorney, Joe Clement, it's kind of funny that we're spending as much time as we are getting through this because it's only two lots and you, you kind of want to say, oh, who cares? They're, they're never going to do that just over two lots. But they did do it in Phoenixville 50 years ago over a couple lots and um, the PUC did. And I don't really want to, I just want to make sure we have it buttoned down. Um, are these properties on Wartman Road that um, border the Steerly property? Correct. Yes. Okay. And, the, and the, the, the Sterley approval actually has the easements for these, so it's been anticipated that they would come in. Um, this is just more of a making sure we, well, af after I speak to the PUC attorney, I'll have a better uh, sense. And, and you know, my gut reaction is that we're okay because it's just these lateral connections with no mains. I think that helps a lot, uh, but I just want to nail it down. Should, should we just wait until you get all your ducks in a row? Before we I, I don't know where they are on the, you know, in the project, or do they hold up Sterley or, or you know, D WB? Sterley is, um, they're finalizing documents to get plans recorded, so they're not, uh, they're probably a couple months away from construction at this point. Yeah, I mean, I asked them to show the two laterals on that plan, but I mean, if they don't get built because this never gets finalized, then the as-built will show that they didn't get built. Right. Yeah, that type of thing. Yeah, so, so it wouldn't hold them up. You we, know, we, either okay. we meet yeah. again on so, December 13th. I, I think we'll just table this until that meeting, and uh, we'll, we'll do it again on December 13th. Okay, that sounds good. That's okay. that, that doesn't create a problem, does it, Bill? I don't see it as a problem. I mean, Steerly can go through without this. I, yeah, I think they can move forward without this. It's yeah. not something that needs to go in first. All right. Okay, we'll do, just uh, want to tread okay. very carefully here. So we'll, we'll wait. We'll table Great this idea. to the December 13th okay. meeting. Okay. Right. Do, I, do I need a motion for it? Do I need a motion for that? Or no, well, table? technically, but I think everyone agreed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. And uh, that ends our business agenda. And uh, now we have manager and department head reports. Everyone should have had, uh, got my manager report over the weekend if there's any questions. Um, we just note our first budget workshop is this Wednesday. At seven, I was thinking uh, keep it in an informal setting, um, maybe sitting in the back here uh, with that flat screen, just to keep it very informal. And uh, we're, we'll have plenty of seats for anybody that wants to wants to join us. All right. And I just want to point out that uh, we have a three budget workshops scheduled at seven p.m. November seventeenth, December first, and December eighth. Then we have a uh, budget adoption special meeting on December 13th, and I think we're going to turn that into a regular board meeting and make that our final meeting for 2021, so we will not then again meet on the 20th. So our last meeting, I'm hoping, <laughs> everything going well, finger in the air, that uh, December 13th will be the final regular meeting of the Board of Supervisors. Um, that, Yeah, I think so. The, this Ida Relief donations, uh, Tim, have we already covered that? That was, uh, that was what you did under That's what we did, okay. All right, we took care of that. Planning Commission is scheduled for December 1st. Is that right, Jeff, the next meeting? Um, right now, we don't have anything for that agenda, so um, okay. we may be canceling that and moving if something comes. We also have a budget meeting scheduled for that night, so there's a little bit of a conflict. So if we need to have another Planning Commission, which I, I don't think we do right now, it would be December 16th. Okay. Or 15th. I'm, the second Wednesday. The vice chair is pointing out to yeah. me that I'm jumping all over the page like a crazy man. 
Okay, consultant reports is where we are. So. Go ahead, consult. <laughs> uh, just briefly, uh, the paving projects are complete in terms of the paving. There's some minor restoration to be done. Um, Pre-construction meetings are being set up for the Tindy run. All the documents have been signed and executed by the contractors. And we'll be opening bids for the Taylor House demolition only on <laughs> December 9th, 21. The barn is the barn's not being demolished. It's being sold. It was sold. <laughs> and the corn crib and the silo was that. sold. <laughs> the corn crib, silo, and barn went together. So. All right. Uh, solicitor's report? Nothing left tonight, thanks. All right. And supervisor's comments? Go ahead. Um, first, uh, you know, in segueing from all the discussion about um, Ida, is I just want to give another shout out to all of our staff who did such a great job. Um, Sue's not here and Sarah's not here, but, but they really coordinated a lot of work and Brian did a ton and Jeff did a ton and police department. I just want to reiterate that everybody did a great job. Moving on to that, uh, my book list for this month <laughs> is Beneath the Tamarind Tree by Aisha Sase, Beasley and the Witch by Willow Mason, Spy Princess by Shrabini, excuse me, Shrabani Basu, Son of Thunder by S.C. Mitchell, Bending Toward Justice by Doug Jones, and Here, Right Matters by Alexander Vindman. Any other comments? All right, and I already talked about our schedule of meetings, so um, if there's no more comments. You've got Parks and Rec in there. Okay. Okay, Parks and Rec meets uh, December 8th. The Municipal Authority meeting is December 2nd. And there are no Zoning Hearing Board meetings scheduled at this time. So, if there's no more comments, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second that. We're adjourned.